Welcome everyone. Good evening. Uh, I'm Haim Brashid Jabner uh, from Jewish Network for Palestine. I'm happy to welcome you to this important event, the second in a series of three. I have a short, short, few short announcements to make, and then um, Dr. Dayan will start her lecture. So first, I ask you all to mute yourself, if not already muted, and also disconnect your video. Um, you know how to do it. It's the um, little button on the left, um, which is called uh, video. Um, this event is being recorded and will be shared on the JNP site uh, later this week, probably tomorrow. So if you know of anyone that misses it, uh, please tell them so. The Q&A session will take place immediately after the talk of about 45 minutes or so. Uh, to pose a question, put it into the chat directly uh, addressed to the host and raise your electronic hand um, through the, uh, through the uh, reactions button. Um, I trust we shall not experience any intentional disruption. If we do, this will lead to immediate expulsion from the webinar. Finally, I wish to thank the chair of JNP, David Cannon, our host for the, for the night, for dealing with the technical aspects behind the scenes. Now, I want to introduce uh, the speaker for tonight. Um, we are fortunate to have with us Dr. Hila Dayan of the uh, Amsterdam University College, who is a political sociologist, and her research covers Mizrahi memory production and the history of the Mizrahi struggle. She is also a co-founder of Gate 48, platform for critical Israelis in the Netherlands and of Academia for Equality, um, which uh, acts for the democratization of Israeli society and academia. Dr. Dayan will speak tonight on remembering the 1950s. The 1950s was the period where the um, denial of um, rights to the Mizrahim was at its height. Um, I just wanted to uh, share with you something that is uh, on the front page of Haaretz uh, newspaper today. And uh, it's a report about legislation, the first important um, legislation of the apartheid state in 1950. And this is the absentee, um, um, absentee landlord legislation, which actually um, removes uh, all the property of Palestinians if they are not um, present on the date of the legislation um, in their homes. Now, of course, they couldn't be present because they were expelled. So first, the Israeli army expelled um, three quarters of the Palestinians. Then um, when they didn't allow them to return, they actually took over their properties. Um, what most Israelis didn't uh, and still don't realize is that this is not a law which um, actually applied to uh, the Palestinian Arabs only, but also to the Jews that came to Israel from the Arab lands. In other words, the Mizrahim, as we call them now, um, are actually, um, you know, for the purposes of the law, um, equal uh, to the Palestinians. The article in Aretz is against uh, the legislation on the whole, but the question at the end of the article is, why do the Mizrahim, uh, uh, why, why are the Mizrahim still included in this legislation, which, um, you know, uh, one member of parliament tried to repeal today, but of course uh, failed, uh, sorry, yesterday, uh, but of course failed. Uh, no one is asking the question, why are the Palestinians included in this legislation? Or in other words, why is there a legislation which is illegal? 
Um, I'm sure uh, Dr. Dayan will relate to it. Please, Hila. Thank you, Chaim. Uh, thank you so much for this opportunity and welcome everyone. It is, it's a beautiful night in Amsterdam. I don't know if you are also just uh, missing out on a, a night out in a beautiful weather, but uh, we're not suffering from global warming here. Anyways, um, uh, bad joke, sorry. Um, I'm gonna go to my presentation in a, in a bit, but before I do that, um, I'd like to uh, continue or remind everyone present here tonight uh, of the construction of this series, which began with Chico's um, Moshe, uh, Behar, Dr. Moshe Behar presentation and, and lecture on the uh, particularly on the, the period that led to the uprooting, the traumatic uprooting of Jews from the Middle East. And uh, this is an, a critical, uh, a critical inter uh, part of our uh, drowned and forgotten and, and repressed history, which uh, uh, Shiko has uh, shared with you. And what I'm going to do is pretty much take it from there uh, and uh, cover the first decade of this uprooting, the trauma, which continued in, in Israel. Um, however, I'm not going to, I, I know from your questions from last time that you are a very knowledgeable crowd. Um, so my focus will be on trying to understand the long 1950s. So it's afterlives, it's, ever presence in Israeli life, psyche, uh, in its political and cultural life. So that's that's what my focus is gonna be uh, tonight. Um, and uh, yeah, I, uh, I think I'm gonna move on to share my, uh, my screen with you. Uh, one second, I lost my presentation here. No, there it is. Um, yes, can it, everybody can see this? Yeah? Yes. Yep. All right. Good. And and oh yeah, and of course, uh, Tzvi is uh, is going to uh, Tzvika uh, Bendo is going to continue uh, the story. I think Tzvika is going to take it to uh, chronologically to uh, uh, the later stages, sixties uh, and the seventies. So we'll have a full kind of chronological uh, story about uh, Mizrahi. Uh, the pictures and the images that I'm using in my presentation are from this uh, Shuk, short animation film by Dotan Romano, based on a, a beautiful and uh, a story written by Sami Bardugo in 2014. And some of it is from the television series Ma Barot, which was aired uh, in the uh, Channel 11 uh, in Israel. Um, yeah, so let's start. We'll start with the contemporary and the most, most kind of uh, uh, most recent uh, mention of Ma'abarot. Uh, this was uh, a few weeks ago when uh, we, uh, we were told in a public letter uh, by uh, Judge Esther Chayut, who's here on the right, writing a personal letter to M.K. Dudi Amsalem from the Likud, uh, a personal letter uh, of, uh, yeah, offense, to, taking offense of his barraging and attacks on the High Court of Israel uh, as a place which is uh, of elitist people, etc., and uh, you know, a, a, an attack on the justice system in Israel in general that she is uh, accusing him uh, of. As part of the, the context is obviously Bibi's, uh, Bibi Netanyahu's uh, trial. So you can see it's quite amazing that <laughs> Judge Chayut, uh, the president of uh, the High Court of Israel, Supreme Court of Israel, is using an official letter to write a private letter basically to MK Amsalem. And she writes among other things, in the Mabara, where I was born and in the poor housing, Shikunin, where I grew up, there were lots of 
from Salamim, Machlufim, Bitanim, Orkabim, side to side with Moskovichim, Hershkovichim, Ravitsim. And as children, we all played together. We sat in the same class and our friendships, uh, friendship lasts still today. Uh, there's other pearls in this kind of uh, open letter, Ikhtav Galui, uh, from the president. Uh, I, won't, I won't go into all the details, but uh, it's, it's really uh, just an incredible, uh, yeah, an incredible letter, which of course immediately uh, brings the 1950s back uh, as, uh, as the story on the Ashkenazi side goes, everyone had a difficult time in the 1950s, everyone was poor, everyone suffered, the states was, uh, you know, there is, there's nothing particularly uh, particular that happened there to uh, the Jews that came from the Middle East and the Islamic world uh, that the Ashkenazim from Eastern Europe didn't suffer from as well. Uh, they also suffered discrimination, they also suffered racism, they also suffered, etc. You know that this this is one of, you know, for me, this letter, um, it, it involves, uh, yeah, a lot of chutzpah from the president of the high court to, uh, to really be kind of at the forefront of the denial of Mizrahi trauma from the 1950s uh, in, her, in her seat. As we know, the Israeli high court uh, has uh, basically no, uh, maybe one, I'm, I'm not even sure, no Mizrahi judges on the high court. This is uh, the, the whole justice system in terms of the top echelons is, is a complete bastion of um, Mizrahi privilege and power. Oh, sorry, Ashkenazi privilege and power in Israel. So yeah, this is, this is indeed quite uh, a performance of, um, yeah, of denial, erasure, uh, lack of recognition, Never mind what David Amsali has ever uh, David Amsalam has ever said about the, the Supreme Court and what we think about it. Um, this performance is quite striking. Uh, now, Malbarot, uh, I'm I'm sure that everyone more or less knows that these were the the, the temporary camps, shacks uh, that were built uh, to absorb, in quotation, the people who arrived in. Uh, particularly in the massive wave of uh, migration to Israel in 49. Uh, interestingly, when I did uh, my research um, in of the epoch in the city of Cologne, where I grew up, um, I, I found there's, there's hardly anything left from the epoch in terms of the material archeological uh, um, yeah, uh, heritage. So there is absolutely nothing uh, that is left except what we know exists in documents, in, in archives, in Zionist archives, in state archives. I happened to yeah, roam around in a neighborhood where I knew um, there were Ma'abarot. By the way, I knew that there were Ma'abarot only through my current research. Because as a, as a child growing up in Poland, we were never, ever told anything about the epoch, nothing about Ma'abarot, nothing about the people in the Ma'abarot in Hulon. And Hulon was actually, it's, it's a city adjacent to Tel Aviv, on the south of Tel Aviv, uh, close to Jaffa, close to Azul. And um, so Hulon is a massive, uh, was a massive Ma'abarot concentration area. At, at the peak of it, there were about 14,000 people uh, arriving and living in Ma'abarot in Cologne. And so, but there was nothing about it in my own upbringing that I could recall. The Zionist story about the city was always of, of course, pioneering, uh, the pioneering uh, veteran Yeshu people who, uh, and that's the motto of our town, despite it all and, uh, and, uh, yeah, despite all the difficulties, that's the motto, they managed to survive all the hardships and uh, build a, a beautiful city. So that's the story. And, um, and of course, there was nothing there to fight. I remember still my teacher in the elementary school saying, all we had to fight was the sand, sand, sand. That's to recall, obviously, that's 
that's the name of of the city Holon on uh, its name on um, after the sand dunes that were that it was famous for at the time. Uh, however, of course, when you research the history of the city, it's quite striking to understand that until basically 1940, there was nothing there in terms of a Jewish issue. There were very, very scattered neighborhoods that were actually all evacuated during the Great Arab Revolt of 1936. They were all scattered. They were running to Mikve Israel where they took shelter. And uh, slowly they came back to these scattered neighbors. And in 1940, the British governor of the area, he declared uh, that this is one city and then they chose the name Hulon. So in fact, this story of Hulon is just, just before uh, the state was founded, there was also a city of Hulon. But in fact, the entire city of how and what came about to be the Hulon that we know today, a massive city, one of the biggest cities in Israel, uh, and one of the most average one in terms of all uh, parameters, socioeconomic, et cetera. You know, but what we know today about the city is that without this massive immigration, there was no Hulon the way that we uh, know without the whole operation around it in the map of what around Hulon, there was no way of talking about Hulon as a city uh, before that time. So I think, yeah, the, what you see in the picture is uh, the last remnant of the Mabarot, I think, in Poulon that I documented in 2015. I was there uh, with archaeologist Gidon Suleimani, and we were uh, looking around, and then we saw it. And it was just really striking to find a relic of the 1950s in my city. And look how beautifully kept the garden is. We found out that uh, a 100 year old woman, uh, uh, Naja, was living there with her uh, uh, caregiver. And she was 100 years, years old in 2015. You can be sure that probably she is no longer with us. And probably this check doesn't stand there anymore. Uh, and that this is, yeah, I was just lucky to document uh, that beautifully kept garden and shack, uh, a document that Mabarot ever existed in my hometown, a story that no Israeli child uh, hears about, learns about, and uh, knows about in their school curriculum. Um, so that's the, the, the epoch uh, in my city. And um, here I move to another, um, yeah, another uh, is another example for how that the epoch of the Mabarot is documented or thought about. This is from a series uh, that was aired in 2019 uh, called Mabarot. Uh, it is an amazing series. I think it has four parts. Uh, in the first part, the the researchers and the people who worked on this series in Kan uh, Chatesre. Uh, they were very smart, I think, to start with that story that Chayut is telling us, the story that everybody suffered, that there were Ashkenazim, that there were migrants from all over the world who were housed in Mabarot, and everybody went through the transition phase uh, in that uh, absorption uh, period. So they start, this is the first chapter of the series, and, and then they move, I think, in this, only in the second one, you realize, and this is based on a very, very meticulous historical research done by uh, Dr. Hila Barad Shalom. Uh, she's another Hila, she's the real historian. And uh, yeah, everything is met meticulously documented, really scientifically established. This is not a propaganda series. This is really a an, an knowledgeable and knowledge production type of uh, cultural artifact that we have today to explain this epoch. And it was aired uh, on, on channel uh, 11. So uh, before, right before that, uh, that was in 2017, um, there was another very important series that I want to tell you about. It's called Salah Kansa Eretz Israel, Salah Theories Eretz Israel. It has an English name that has nothing to do with this title, but let's stick to Salah. 
Um, and Salah is even more interesting because it is done by David Derry, who is uh, uh, a uh, who grew up in Yerucham and he is uh, from the periphery of Israel and uh, Moroccan descent. Um, and he is grappling with the epoch, with the 1950s, in a very intense, and again, goes to the experts, goes to Eris Befadia and all the people who have researched uh, very carefully the, what the so-called, particularly the saga of population scattering, which I will go back, get back to. And again, I think that if we look at these two series, documentary series that we have, we see that the epoch in the really in recent years gets very serious attention. So despite the fact that all Israelis grow ignorant about the Mizrahi history and struggle, we know for sure that we now have two documentary series that have been extremely well done and that and nobody can claim, let's say it this way, in, the, in Israel that they don't know anything about it, that this doesn't exist, that the story of the Mizrahim is, a, is an invention. And wh whoever does that uh, is, is a denial, denialist, you know, and, and, uh, and that's how we should treat uh, the reactions such as that of uh, Esther uh, Chayut. So here in this slide, you see um, my dear friend and mentor, uh, Gadi El Ghazi, who also researched Ma'abarot. I, I hope that his book is, will come out uh, very soon. Um, he's really a historian again, and uh, he, he researched not only the epoch of the Ma'abarot, but also their demolition or abolition. So it's, it's uh, fascinating what he discovered that in fact, uh, the epoch of the, Mabar of the Mabarot, the transition camp, the, which um, do I need to say, these were the most uh, yeah, rudimentary places where people didn't have sanitary uh, infrastructure, where there was a, an endemic uh, unemployment, where there was extreme poverty and uh, conditions that are just uh, horrendous. So the Ma'abarot survived, uh, the research of Gadi tells us, well into the 1970s. So in or more or less around 1956 or 57, Golda Meir and uh, Eshkol are declaring the end of the Ma'abarot. So they are celebrating or announcing that Ma'abarot Khuslu, uh, that they were uh, yeah, they don't, they no longer exist. Well, this was a big lie. Uh, although I can say from the story of Hulon, for instance, that indeed in these years, uh, around 56 and 57 in Hulon, there was a massive attempt to build, very hastily build Shikunim apartments and to indeed liquidate the Mabarot. In fact, liquidation is the more appropriate name. Uh, the why is it interesting uh, that it lasts till the 70s and some would say even till today uh, that's the afterlife right so many of these Ma'abarot uh, particularly in the center of the country where most of the population live so around the Gush Dan or the, the area of the center around Tel Aviv or around the coastal area so particularly there Ma'abarot uh, are to date the, you can say, socioeconomically depressed areas. And uh, I once looked at a, at a map in Hulon of voting demographics, and it was pretty striking to compare or to kind of, uh, yeah, uh, put the maps on top of each other, the map of voting and the maps of where the Mabarot were located. Because it was pretty clear that the Shasniks in Hulon and the Likudniks in Hulon they all live in those neighborhoods that are more peripheral to the center of the city and that are sort of the descendants uh, spatially uh, in terms of spa spatial uh, geo geographical spread uh, of those Mabarot uh, uh, era. Um, so that's an important fact to remember that this is an, a lingering uh, heritage that perhaps was 
officially liquidated at the last of them in the 1970s, but in fact, it continues. I continue with the series with uh, uh, another slide um, from the series. So the series Ma'abarot also brings us testimonials, simply people who uh, lived in the Ma'abarot and uh, grew up there. I would say that the, the generation of my father, uh, who were, they were the Ma'abarot children. He's now in his 70s. Uh, so these are more or less the people that they uh, they saw. That they were all people who grew up uh, in in, uh, and and you hear the stories, you hear the testimonials. And my dear friend Omri Ben Yehuda, he wrote uh, a wonderful, brilliant piece. I hope he has an English version of it. I read it in Hebrew. Uh, he talks about how important it is to listen to the testimonials of these people. We are about to lose, we, I mean, our generations are about to lose these people. They are passing and we haven't heard their stories. So I think the series is also an amazing tribute to that generation of the Marlboro. And um, they tell the story of their broken parents and they tell the story of their growing up or being coming of age in, uh, in most extreme and extraordinary uh, circumstances. Um, the the amount of uh, yeah uh, of personal hardships that uh, that people have uh, suffered and they suffered it for long years perhaps as I said till the seventies some but more or less many of them for an, for the whole of the decade uh, the state building decade forty nine to fifty nine more or less that's the the, the crucial era. Uh, era. So we're talking about the, gener the, the desert generation, the generation of the refugees, the people who, are, who came to Israel totally disoriented, lost everything. They lost property and they lost dignity and they lost culture and they lost their language. And uh, the, 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 the extent of the loss is, is really breathtaking. Uh, I'll get to the analysis of it in a second or the afterlives of it, but. Here, this, this witness is telling us, it really sends me to say, but people really hated this country. And I hear that from a lot of, um, uh, let's say not from my dad's generation, not from the generation of the children of the Mabarot, but, uh, but more from the older generations, how incredible was that sense of abandonment Disillusion, disillusionment, and and yeah, hatred of the state, and that's we have to keep that in mind because I'll return to that when I talk about the democratic imaginary of Mizrahim and their democratic need for recognition. Um, you hate the country that dispossesses you, so let's keep it in mind. I know that in our minds, Mizrahim are like the most state worshipping, uh, perhaps, population in Israel. Uh, I don't think that's true. They are not more state worshiping than any other Jewish uh, citizens of Israel who are Zionists and with Zionist upbringing. Um, but yeah, that's the sentiment. So this hatred continues; it lives on, and it is it is simmering. It's it's a volcano, I would say, of a simmering uh, resentment that is still with us today. Um, this uh, persona, one of the witnesses in the series, was a police officer in the Ma'abarot. Um, yeah, of course, some Mizrahim um, took positions in police forces and security forces, and they were, um, as my friend Meir Amor liked to say, they were the, um, what was it, Meir, how do you call it? The, the managers of the Ma'abarot, right? You call it menale uh, ma'abarot. You you use this kind of figure of speech to say someone who is collaborating with uh, the mimsad, the the institution, the establishment. But anyways, this person actually tells very heartbreaking stories about uh, how the desperation at the time was so vast from the conditions, from the unemployment, from the lack of, uh, of any prospects for betterment that many people broke down, many committed suicide, uh, and he details how they did it in the series. Uh, 
hanging, pills, poison, uh, etc. Uh, heartbreaking, uh, yeah, reality. Uh, one of the witnesses in the series actually tells the story of as a of a childhood trauma of witnessing these uh, people hanging themselves in the shacks. Um, so now I uh, I want to take you on a journey to again to Israeli contemporary uh, culture and pop culture, and this goes even beyond Israel because this band Awa of the three sisters. Uh, who are from Yemenite descent, uh, is globally famous. They are featured, they were featured in, in the last bit of a marvelous exhibition that I saw in Paris, uh, the exhibition on the history of Jews in the Middle East. And I thought this was such an amazing tribute of the Institut du Monde Arabe in Paris to end their exhibition about this multimillennial history of the Jews in the Middle East with this, uh, with the song and with the memory of descendants of uh, uh, people of uh, uh, people from the Arab world and the Islamic world uh, in Israel, and yeah, the lyrics are very strong. The whole the whole thing is is contemporary, is cutting edge. Let's listen to it for a couple of minutes. I hope you can enjoy with me the the lyrics and the the whole aesthetic. Yes, wonderful, wonderful lyrics, wonderful presentation memory working, the memory working, the trauma of their grandparents. Uh, this is not Yemen here. Uh, you see in brackets, don't let them take your daughter. I'll come back to that. Uh, why do they say that? Because of the affair that, that, that I'm, I'm, I'm going to uh, soon address. I came to you fleeing, that's in the, in the course, and, but you saw me as primitive, but you humiliated me. So this is again contemporary um, pop music and uh, a contemporary reworking of the trauma and the aesthetics you can see of the Mabarot uh, epoch. Now, uh, this is another, this is one way of working the trauma in the Israeli contemporary culture. And another way is how politicians and particularly the Likudniks are uh, using and, and, and working with this memory, Mizrahi memory. Uh, and they are uh, doing that in a, in a very kind of particular way. I, uh, I do think that uh, the quote that I'm gonna show you now of Galit, a uh, member of Knesset from the Likud, uh, Galit Yusal, uh, she is sort of infamous for, for a very loud and, and kind of vulgar um, presence. Uh, she's kind of a headline uh, uh, producer for the BB supporters camp, uh, still is defending Netanyahu at any, at any uh, possible moment. And, uh, but she says here in, in a uh, uh, discussion in the Knesset about uh, the budgets, uh, she says uh, she's, berat she's berating the new government about, yeah, you're calling yourself the government of change, you're calling yourself socialist. What are you talking about? Netanyahu reduced inequality. And you, Mapainiks, cannot admit that you created the gaps. Pe'arim, we call it in Hebrew, right? The gap between Mizrahim and Ashkenazim, namely. For example, with your red booklet. So this whole speech that you gave around the budget um, was pretty much littered with this kind of knowledge of the 1950s or Mizrahi traumatic memory of it. Uh, the Mapainiks obviously evidently uh, in relation to the, the, Mapa, the, the party of Ben-Gurion in the 1950s. Now, a word about the Mapai era. Um, in contradiction to what we are used to imagine about this era, I mean, Israelis like to imagine that this was a good and a Republican era, right? Where everybody took care of each other, where there was this unity, where there was this kind of purpose in building the state. We call it in Zionist lingo, mamlachtiyut, right? The Republicanism, the idea that everybody should push and pull together uh, in order to make this place a good place for everyone. Uh, so that's the myth of republicanism of the decade, the state building decade. 
And Mapai, we know, however, from critical sociology and history. For instance, the accounts of Smadar uh, Sharon um, and Daphna uh, Hirsch, who studied uh, very meticulously uh, aspects of this uh, era. So what we know, especially Smadar Sharon's uh, uh, book on the Lachish uh, project, she very carefully shows how it is not, it was indeed, uh, Mapai was very powerful, but we should not take it as a political party. Mapai was more the way that she described it, that's my interpretation. Mapai was running a mafia state. So the mafia was a very close knit network of very, very influential decision makers. So they were really uh, around Ben Gurion, a circle of around, I would say, about five to 10 figures. And these figures were extremely powerful and extremely influential. And they took care of this Mamlachiyut of Republicanism, of pursuing this grand planning uh, um, schemes for everyone else, uh, and particularly benefiting the, uh, the veteran issue. Uh, this central and draconian planning uh, would come to treat everyone else as human material, as dust, basically, as malleable stuff that can be just shoved around. Um, so I think that when, uh, to just kind of represent again, the, I'll come back to the, the red booklet in a second, uh, but just to give you a sense, and I'm sure you know that of the, of the zeitgeist of the era, but just kind of let's, let's recall. So Golda Meir in 1951 says, those occupying the fancy cafes in Tel Aviv and those living in luxury homes can sleep soundly. Socially, the veteran community was unharmed by the mass immigration. So the, 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 the mafia state took care that uh, the veteran issue will not uh, suffer from the mass immigration. They, took, they saw it as their mission to defend uh, that uh, veteran issue from this mass. And, and that uh, Ben Gurion continued and it's quoted, I think that's one of the most memorable quotes from the Salah uh, series uh, on television. Ben Gurion said in 1954, Zot this is an inevitable discrimination. So he literally acknowledged that this is how they treat anyone who's not uh, European or from the veteran issue. Um, and he rationalized it, right? Uh, again, my friend Henri uh, relates to it and says, you know, this was innocent in the sense that this was common sense. I think he meant to say uh, an innocent racism in the sense of that was the zeitgeist. That was the common sense of the era. To me, the more important quote here is that of these anonymous central planners, right? The economists, the very powerful minds behind the population schemes in the 1950s. So they were saying all of our economic plans are conditioned upon control through sovereign rule. So it's conditioned upon our ability to generate uh, obedience right to rule rule over that mass mass of people and this racial panic that we see here is is going to is is the enduring legacy of the epoch as well there was enormous racial panic about the mass immigration particularly from arab countries now let's go back to the in casa dom and to the red the booklet and to the mapai and to uh, and the control and the allocations. Uh, I'm, I'm showing you here on the left side, this is from my own research in the archives of Lavon Institute, uh, the Institute of the uh, Workers uh, Movement, of the Labor Movement, sorry. Uh, and so from the Lavon, uh, you see kind of the, the pages are about to kind of collapse, to deteriorate uh, uh, permanently. But uh, we, Mizrahim, have the, the, the story always about the, the point system, shitata nekudot. So the point system was to a sort of arithmetic calculation of who gets to get a shikun, who gets to get housing. 
the story of social and public house, housing allocation and in that epoch is enormously important to understand Israel today. Uh, we're talking about a country where uh, housing is in shortage, permanent shortage, where control over housing, who owns a house, is a defining feature of your prospects today. I'm talking about today. So whoever has property, owns a house in Israel, is considered well off. But there is a vast population in Israel that is unable to own properties because they never inherited properties the way that, um, let's say, the veteran uh, population of Israel was able to give this inheritance to, to their descendants. Uh, Mizrahim, very uh, yeah, tellingly, when in the, in the in the 1990s, when we were fighting uh, in the framework of Akeshet Demokratit and Mizrahit for social for what what we demanded back then in the 1990s was, if you give people from kibbutzim and people who have control over lands that the state gave them, if you give them the right to build houses for their sons, what we called banim amshichim, then please make the law equal to everyone and give people who paid all their lives dues to public housing very small and very deteriorated conditions in these former Ma'abarot areas, please give their sons and daughters the right to live there. Because what happens was the, the parents from the desert generation would die and the people will be thrown out and they will have nothing. They will possess nothing that they could not even a, a house, a, a roof over their head. Anyways, this is from the Lavon. The left side shows the point system, right? Four people, 15 years in the country, so veteranship in the country, and how uh, how many months, or or I think it's months, yeah, 20 months uh, in membership in the Histadrut. So the infamous red booklet, the Pinkas Adom, refers to how long have you been a Histadrut member, uh, on the basis of that arithmetic calculation, which the Mizrahim remember as one of the most horrible, corrupt, um, yeah, like nepotistic system, right? You had to fight really with your teeth uh, to get these points to be registered. If you weren't registered, you were uh, not getting anywhere. Uh, on the right side, I, uh, I, uh, I quote or I show, uh, yeah, I, I'm not gonna go into the source at the moment, just to give you a sense of what happened. Uh, yeah, on the right side, the right page, you see that one person, Mordechai Al-Kayam, he is like a Ben-Gurion closest aide in terms of allocation of the loot from 48 in Jerusalem. So Ben-Gurion uh, gives powers to that person to decide who's gonna get the loot in Jerusalem. And, uh, and he decides, Shaul Avigdo, uh, decides to make allocations according to his whim. People, he complains that people also just grabbed properties and invaded and, and took over the Palestinian houses in Jerusalem. Uh, we're specifically talking about the German colony, the Bakka neighborhood and the Greek colony, very nice and affluent, uh, neighborhoods in Jerusalem. Now, the Palestinian neighborhood of Talbia was divided uh, through this uh, mafia-like uh, state apparatus, uh, divided and, and given to senior government officers, close aides to the government, judges, there we go, Hebrew university professors, uh, etc. So the mafia worked really well for those who until today are uh, very privileged in Israeli society. Now let's talk about the contemporary uh, state. Like where is this epoch finding us today in our, in our struggles today? I wanna quote uh, two of my best friends, uh, Hani Zubeda and uh, Benny Nurieli. They have a series of articles in Haaretz. I really recommend that you follow them. I'm not sure all their uh, uh, op-eds are published uh, in, um, in English, but if you can access their work, it's fantastic because what they are following is the rise of a new mentality, which they call neo-mapainik. So the, who are the neo-mapainiks? 
what do they want? How do they operate? How do they think? And what are the struggles that we have today against this neo-Mafinic mentality? The first thing that we say, and we say that again from the 1990s, from the times of Akeshe, equal law for everyone, state law, right? If you are calling yourself Republicans, then be Republicans. Don't act like a junta. But people in Israel act like juntas, right? So we have neo-Mafinics. Most of them are located in Ashkenazi Bastion of Privilege. For instance, uh, the kibbutzim that rule the, the, uh, um, the uh, councils that have control over land, a lot of land in control of the, in the hands of people who are from the kibbutz and moshevim uh, lobbies, and they control the allocations. And they also control physically the land and access to the land and access to rivers. For instance, the Asi River, uh, a few years ago, there was the, this is not from a few years ago, it even goes back, but uh, some activists in recent years have waged a fight against this. You see this gate, the yellow gate in every kibbutz, in every uh, commun gated community in Israel, you see this uh, gate. Um, simply, simply put, the, the gate of this kibbutz near David is closing off a river called the Asi, who is, uh, which is a river which is supposed to be, according to state law, open access, open to everyone. Uh, but the kibbutz decided, uh, the kibbutz built a whole tourism industry around that. It controls the resource, it takes care of the resource, of course, putting the barbarians outside the gate, right? That's how they call them, literally, in their attacks on the activists that demand public access to the river. So that's the contemporary struggles that echo this, um, yeah, this control of resources, the neo uh the neo mafinic bastions of power that we still have uh, in Israeli society. Um, echoes of the past and the present. Here I come to a very, very painful uh, affair. Um, the affair of children of the Mabarot. I spoke about children of the Mabarot when we, I talked about the series and the witnesses. Um, so again, I think that many stories emerge from the struggle to understand what happened with children who had disappeared from the Mabarot. Um, I'm not, this, this in itself, this affair and everything that goes around it, especially it's contemporary, uh, um, yeah, it's contemporary uh, uh, discourse and the, what happens today. All of this is demands a whole webinar in itself. I, I'm just going to say one thing that um, the conditions of poverty were so severe and deprivation that uh, some people even considered selling their children. I'm not even talking about uh, children that were taken by uh, welfare and, and uh, yeah, and hospitals, etc., but disappeared and we don't know what happened to them. That's the, the affair that we're, we are engaging. But here, for instance, in this case, the, the series is featuring a case of a family which needed so desperately the money. And so they were willing to sell a fetus. She was pregnant for the seventh time, the, the woman. And they, the, the father says, we just need this 880 liras uh, for the child. That's the sum that we need to travel to France. Obviously, people of post-colonial Maghreb background who arrived to Israel and, um, and just wanted to leave. You know, they, they just couldn't stand it anymore. Uh, many, by the way, left. So here you see the English page of the Amuta, the, the NGO Amram is uh, one of the kind of independent sources that we have for this affair, the Yemenite Mizrahi and Balkan children affair. Uh, they're part, I would say, of this memory search, right? The state doesn't take care of the memory of the Mabarot, uh, but they do. They collect the testimonies. They go after the archives. They demand the opening of the archives. Uh, they set their own independent archives. You can visit their website to watch the testimonies and the films. They're very well made. And the main struggle today is recognition. That's the motto of the struggle today. 
recognition, justice, and healing. And the last kind of ditch in that uh, multi-year affair uh, and the struggle to make this public was that finally the Ministry of Health in Israel this year uh, wrote a report. There was a report by a committee of experts that was written where they started working on the recognition and healing. Never mind justice that belongs to the, the investigating committees that were uh, investigating this affair, et cetera. But the ministry, in the Ministry of, of Health, they started working on this idea of healing, of hearing the testimonies and of trying to apologize for what had happened, to take responsibility for what happened during the epoch of the 1950s. And uh, as it goes, this report was never published. Uh, it was given after, after some, I suspect, you know, some powerful, of course, figures in, in the government or inside the ministry discovered that the content of the report is very actually pathbreaking, right? Pathbreaking in recognition and in suggesting a kind of a, a apology, apology and healing. So after that uh, was discovered and it was already kind of leaked, et cetera, they decided to never publish this report. There was a, there's a big fight now of Amram together with Physicians for Human Rights in Israel to publish the, the findings of the report. They gave it to examination to a historian, a historian that is known to be from the camp of deniers. Now, here we go again, another, uh, the same concept, the same thing as uh, I said about Chayut, the deniers. So that's where, how they buried it. I'm coming now to the part in my lecture and I'm gonna to try to wrap up where I give you a sense of how do we wrap our heads around what happened during this period and why. Um, can everybody see my presentation? Right? Is it, well, yeah, okay. So uh, going well. So now let me kind of put it in a, in a very striking, I hope, uh, in a very clear terms. We are speaking about a post-Nakba, uh, a post-Nakba situation where you have, in my analysis, a minority authoritarian rule. Uh, not a democracy, not even for the Jew. And what do I mean by that? I mean that you have a minority European society. That's the issue. Mind you, the nucleus of the issue was about 150,000, 200,000 in 48, something like that. A tiny, tiny nucleus, right? And then you have the rest. And who are the rest? Yeah, of course, masses of, of refugees from Europe, but also the masses from the Middle East. And um, well, we know, as I uh, presented, the, that tiny minority that ruled uh, took care of its own, namely of people from European descent. The rest, who were the rest? The, those were obviously the, uh, the survivors of the Nakba and the Middle East refugees, Jewish refugees. And together, that's why I'm calling the, the state in that epoch, in, in the 1950s, not the state of Israel, but Yeshuv state. This was still, there was an ongoing, despite the upheaval, which Shiko also very carefully delineated. There was a demographic upheaval. Everything changed, right? But this, there was one continuity, and that is the minority rule. And as a minority rule of the issue state. Now, if we, um, if we consider that, that on the Palestinians, of the, the, the survivors of 48 of the Nakba, there was a military regime, we also have to consider what happened to the Jews uh, who were the refugees from the Middle East. They were put under what I call civil authoritarian bureaucracy. It's a civil authoritarian bureaucracy that takes, that takes control over everything, all aspects of their lives. In fact, when you read the protocols and the documents and the historical material from the period, you realize that they really didn't consider Mizrahim as citizens, despite the fact that they had formal citizenship, right? Unlike the Palestinians. But despite the fact that they had formal citizenship, their citizenship was considered 
suspended or conditioned. They had to show that they are worthy of this, uh, that they can be halutzim, that they can be pioneers, that they can engage, that they can build the country just like the veteran issue. In fact, in the mindset of, of the veterans, they did their thing. They, they should now get all everything from the state. The state should reward them and let those masses do the rest of the work from now. That was that that kind of quotes, that kind of zeitgeist even appears in Avi Picard's work. He's a Zionist and he's a he's a kind of a you know defender of the state in the in that period. So it, it appears even in his uh, um, historical account. The thing that's important to realize is that these grand schemes that they had to control this demographic, to control the population threat. I talked about racial panic that was seen as a day during the shoot state uh, was none, none less than dictatorial, totalitarian, total in every aspect, right? There were, you had to fight really, fight to try to avoid the grand scheme, you can say. So if to kind of put it all together, what was the Mizrahi population problem of the time, right, of the epoch? Um, how were they absorbed? They were absorbed by dispersion. The government decided, and that's Salah, the series shows that really well. The government decided really pointedly, 14 people are gonna go to that dot and 69 people are gonna be sent with trucks to this dot. And so people were just simply concentrated in Mabarot and then dispersed. Later on, they were even dispersed without even passing the Mabarot, just straight on to godforsaken locations and dumped there. So this racial panic over the human material uh, was treating people as human dust, setting them up in no man's land without state infrastructure. And this created until today, what we know, uh, this homogenous ethnic spaces that were used as labor reserves also for the kibbutzim and, the, uh, and other industries in the area. This combined with very tight control over people's movements, not only where they live, but also are they allowed to move? Are they allowed to take themselves and move somewhere else, rent somewhere else? No, they were not. So throughout the period, you had tight restrictions of movement in government managed locations. You had dislocations and you had forced removals from locations. I bet that some of you who are familiar with South Africa and South African history, are already hearing the echoes of what I'm gonna say next. If we look at South Africa as I did, for trying to understand Israel-Palestine, and you look at historical apartheid, you'll see that in my perspective, this is the key phenomenology. A spatial disorganization of population, a monopoly over means of domestic movement, right? A domestic movement regime, a mass denationalization, so that people are made refugees on supposedly their own land or living as if they live on a foreign territory. Uh, depoliticization of this regime, right? With the Palestinian and the military regime, it's very clear, it's a political construct that aims not to give them citizenship and block refugee return. With the case of the Jews from the Middle East, the refugees from the Middle East, we're talking about a depoliticization of this authoritarian control, right? So it's, it's coded in the language of service provision, coded in the language of um, taking care of them or absorbing. But in fact, that's exactly the language that depoliticizes the authoritarian control that the government had on uh, masses of people at the time. And obviously another line intersecting with uh, the historical example of apartheid is the chronic failure of the schemes. It was a failure. Mabarot was a failure. The Shikonim was a failure. The exclusion was a failure. It was a failure back then in the 1950s, and it continues to be a failure today, right? Because people were not gonna let the state determine everything for themselves, right? Or for their children, because there's resistance, because there is uh, the type of resistance that we don't imagine as resistance, for, for instance, abandoning locations where they were dumped in, even despite hardships and despite uh, being punished for it by the state. So that legacy, I 
think you know I think we can call this uh, this legacy um, definitely a legacy of historical apartheid in Israel Palestine, which didn't start with the occupation and didn't start with uh, apartheid today. It's a different, it's a, it's a, yeah, we can discuss this analogy later. I'm coming to, I'm drawing to an end because I'm very curious to hear your uh, questions. This is a picture of Azul. It's very, it's adjacent to Holon, my hometown. Um, what you see here is Azul is a Mizrahi uh, location. Uh, this entire area, this is an area where Ma'abarot were in the past. And it, it's very adjacent to the Hulon industrial zone where there were also massive Ma'abarot. All of this, Azur and the industrial zone of Hulon were once obviously a Palestinian territory, Palestinian land, which was officially annexed in 1949. I have the annexation uh, letter if you wish. Um, but look at this, this is today. Right, this is Mizrahim today in Azur, nice kind of, yeah, I would say even Mediterranean villas. Um, surrounding the well of the Palestinian, uh, from the Palestinian Nakba, uh, right? The remnants of the, the Nakba very much there in the landscape, in front of them, in front of their eyes, right? Uh, this picture speaks volumes to me and, um, and again, I'm mentioning again, my friend Omri, I mentioned you a lot Omri today, but Omri speaks about three, three traumas that are ongoing and are competing or intersecting. These are obviously the Holocaust, the Mizrahi trauma and the Nakba. And we see this, I think uh, here as well. Uh, but while the Holocaust and the Nakba are traumas that are constantly more worked into memory through the descendants memory and through our discourses and through our struggles. The Mizrahi memory is really of a different kind. It's still, despite what I've been telling you today, still under very heavy repression. It is not a worked out memory. It's a memory that bursts. I call it a will to memory. It's like when people want to remember, it is remembered. But most of the time people don't want to remember. So uh, to quote Butler from Omri's uh, text, uh, Judy Butler says, there is no purifying language of uh, traumatic residue and no way to work through trauma except the arduous effort it takes to direct the course of its repetition. So we have trauma that repeats. We see the 1950s bursting again and again and again and again in public discourse, but all we can do is witness it coming up. And all we can do is to try to strive to direct the repetition. And I think this echoes again, what I suggested that, uh, you know, that the struggle or the Mizrahi struggle continues in that sort of vein. Um, yeah, perhaps I will skip this because I want to just say, um, you know, we in controlling the direction of the trauma, we give it a sense, we give it a purpose. What could be the purpose of Mizrahi memory? How can it uh, intersect with the memory of the Nakba? In what way can we try to make it not a competing narratives? For instance, Mizrahi memory is a fantastic playing field for uh, the populist right wing uh, and the Likud and whoever wants to make uh, a lot of noise about it. Uh, but how can we kind of take over? How can we show the, the connections uh, to uh, the 1950s, our connections, our trauma in relation to, um, yeah, the entire story of Israel-Palestine. And I end with uh, Sami, Sami Shalom Shitrit, who says in the series, oh my God, you know, <laughs> our saga, our history is so interesting. It is so important. It's such, so little told. It is, it is so, um, yeah, it gives such a complexity, a richness, to the whole story of Israel Palestine. And he says, yeah, this place would have been a total bore if not for us, for Mizrahim. <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, I'd love to hear you uh, now. Thank you very, very much, Hila, for an informative and passionate presentation. I hope everyone uh, realizes 
how difficult this job Hila has this evening uh, to do. Um, to cover this period, uh, you remember um, Shiko um, 10 days ago has presented uh, the nine countries um, from where um, the Mizrahim came. Uh, so we're talking about a very complex community or a complex group of communities. Um, and uh, for the Ashkenazim, uh, they were all the same. In other words, they were not important and they were not important in the same manner. Um, while um, it's actually a very detailed story, which is impossible to do in one session. So I think we already decided in JNP that we'll continue this series into a second series. And I'm talking to a number of people, including Yuval Avery, uh, who has already agreed to do um, one in the next series. Um, and uh, waiting to hear from the others. Uh, I just wanted, before I open for a Q&A, uh, to ask one question. Uh, I hope you're all thinking about your questions and preparing to ask them. Um, one question I think is uh, really important to um, pose here. You mentioned, um, well, you didn't have time to talk about that, but I'm asking you to give a few minutes uh, to this topic. Um, people heard, but know very little, about the Yemenite children issue. Uh, this is an issue um, basically so incredible that we need to give it um, some focus here, if, if, if we may. Uh, could you explain um, to um, the audience what we're talking about and where it is now after all those, after yes. the seven, dec seven decades. It's very difficult because it's a real saga. And uh, as I said, deserves its own uh, webinar. I would say, uh, you know, very shortly, uh, please check the Amram uh, website for that. There were uh, a number, uh, you know, what we know is that there's uh, a few dozens of families registered in Israeli justice system as, as not having found or losing children in that period, <laughs> most of them around the 1950s, um, going to hospitals, giving birth, and then the child disappears. There is no grave. There's no body. There's some kind of death uh, announcement, and, and they don't know what happened to the children. <coughs> there's each case is its own unique trauma, its own unique uh, case. But this has been investigated once in the 90s and then, uh, and then again in the 2000s. And uh, there were uh, a couple of more, if not three of, uh, of these uh, um, yeah, official investigation uh, committees, commissions. Um, the state did everything uh, it can to silence these very weak families. Let's say, it, let's be honest about it. These are really like descendants of uh, extremely kind of uh, disenfranchised families uh, who, yeah, who dared to say, we lost children and we have no idea for decades and decades where they are. And we don't believe the story that they are dead, buried, disappeared. We want to know what happened to our children. That's the, the demand and that's the story. Uh, now, from this nucleus of the families that are recognized as officially belonging to this case by these official state commissions that were investigating it and were, ex you know, were doing all kinds of investigations, still not finding the answers for all the families, but some families do, they did get some kind of uh, an official answer from the state, but never recognition, compensation, nothing. So all of that was going on. And in recent years, there was this kind of, yeah, very heated uh, uh, debate among scholars. There's some scholars that really devote nowadays time and effort to uncover this affair. And some other scholars devote time and effort to debunk uh, the notion that the state uh, is in any way responsible for the disappearance of these children. As I said, Chaim, I would like to put it in the context of the misery of the era in general, right? So when people are poor, 
all kinds of horrible things happen, right? Uh, people abandon people, uh, children as well. People try to sell their children as well, as I showed. You know, so this also happened in the context of enormous desperation, poverty, and disenfranchisement. Uh, thank you. And I now will ask uh, Una uh, to unmute and ask your question. Uh, Emma, and to understand then, at the moment, the settlers are encouraged to come to Israel, yes? And the government is encouraging that, and they can do whatever they want with the Palestine. Does that mean it is for the government to control the settlers and the settlers can do what they want as long as they get some food, some water? Am I on the right track or am I fantasizing? I'm not sure I understand. But at the moment, uh, yeah. settlers are coming to Israel, yes? Yeah. I mean, yeah more Palestinian will be kicked out of the land. But it, does that mean that the government is encouraging it in order for yeah. them to control those settlers? You do what you want with the uh, Palestinian and we will help you settle in Palestine. Are you with um, me? I, I think that what you mean to say uh, is that, uh, yeah, the government does what it wants with settlers, but you're, so you're defining the refugees from the Middle East as settlers. Is that what you want to? In other words, okay. I'll be encouraged to come and they can do whatever they want and punished mm -hmm. as long as they attack the Palestinians in order for the government, the Zionist government, to control those settlers. Um, uh, look, I spoke about the very kind of. Uh, uh, yeah, very centralized. And now when people say centralized, they think, oh, that's good, right? State centralizes all kinds of massive operations. And particularly when it wants to build its economy, build its demography, build, etc. You have to try to kind of look at the era from sort of that mindset, right? The state building kind of epoch. And yes, yeah, so there's a lot, of, there's control involved, but I, again, I would emphasize the dramatic disenfranchisement, right, mm -hmm. uh, of the mass of the population, right? So a majority of the population, Palestinians and refugees from the Middle East, mm -hmm. are inherently disenfranchised. So when you're saying central government, central planning, uh, they decide, yeah, they decide uh, with massive consequences, uh, you know, uh, they decide almost to the details of the details, right? Uh, yeah. They decide arbitrarily that this boat that is coming now, the ship from Morocco, we're going to, we're going to just kind of disperse this family and that family and that family to this and that and that location. Mm -hmm. uh, it was that specific on the one hand and, and that massive as well. It was called population scattering, just, okay. just like that. Mm -hmm. um, so that was the idea behind. Okay. Um, but then my other question okay. is, how on earth does it, can the government, Zionist government, can expect peace if they're going to bring back more settlers and more settlers and more settlers? I'm totally, you know, I'm just thinking aloud at the moment. Yeah, I have no answer to that. Maybe Jaime. Uh, Jaime, my friend I Jaime. That, I think that um, we have to remember that um, Basically, there were 600 villages and towns that were emptied of the Palestinian population. Um, so um, the main function um, of the population scattering was to fill those habitations mm -hmm. uh, with people, with Jewish people, so that uh, it will be impossible for the Palestinians to return. Um, I have here a question from uh, Moshe Machover. Um, would you please unmute Moshe? Thank you. Um, Thank you very much. That was very fascinating. Uh, I think, uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, I, I, I'm one of the few, if perhaps the only one in this forum that doesn't need to discover memory that actually remembers uh, that I, I was. Uh, uh, I, I, I was uh, politically active in, in a Mabara near Jerusalem, uh, going there to do political work. 
uh, every week in a company of a, a, a comrade who happens to be uh, from Iraq. Uh, we used to go, you know, to do to do political work on on behalf of the Communist Party. Uh, as such, I would like to, to pose a question: Shouldn't we put class at the center of the analysis? Because the Mizrahim were brought specifically uh, uh, as not only colonization for them, but as a Jewish uh, working class. The issue there was not a hundred. Uh, uh, 20,000, it was 600,000 uh, 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 souls at the time of the creation of Israel. Um, it, it lacked a, a Jewish working class and a, a Jewish colonizers. The, unlike the colonization of South Africa, which was based on exploiting the labor power of the indigenous people, Zionist colonization was more like the colonization of North America or Australia in that it relied, but in this case, knowingly and specifically on the labor power of the settlers. The settlers were supposed to be, and the settlers were supposed to be Jewish. So this, uh, following the Nagba, left the Yeshub with the problem of uh, uh, the need for a working class and specifically the reservoir of the uh, uh, Jewish working class that they imported was uh, uh, the, from the uh, neighboring uh, uh, Middle Eastern countries, uh, mid, Middle East and North African countries. So uh, I think this, this, this uh, uh, I, I, my question is, shouldn't this insight Yes, uh, yes, sure. uh, I understand. Be, be, be a, an entrance point to really understand the, the whole the the, uh, the the whole problem of the, of right. the attitude to the Mizrahi. The, as I said, as I uh, said my analysis uh, is, 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 is more... Uh, uh, yeah. the, the, the term apartheid is, is not helpful in this case because okay. it is a, a different form of apartheid. The apartheid I, I was talking that, about the practices or the, yes, the, idea, yes, yes, the, the attitude to the population. And uh, but we can, you know, every every comparison we can, uh, yes, yeah, yes, but we can I, say I, there I, are also differences. In order uh, to understand, in order to understand the, the, the underlying reality, yeah, yeah. Uh, we have to understand that whereas the racism towards the Palestinians were a racism of colonizers towards the colonized, the racism towards the Mizrahim was a, a, had a, a, a strong class a, a component. But I would say. Let's talk about an, making them an underclass rather than, you know, I, as I said, you know, my focus was just to show you the memory work, how this yeah. is a bubbling thing. The period is not over. It's the long 1950s. It continues, continues yes. to inform Israeli society, psyche, etc. That's what I wanted to show. Yes. Of course, you can do a class analysis. Everybody did that. Gershon Shapir did that. You know, there is enough political economists who did that. What I want to say is, we know from our critical sociology that a lot, you know, that there's a whole kind of uh, process of making the making of them, uh, the, the the refugees as an, as the underclass. What I find fascinating is that when they were scattered, right, when they were sent to, for instance, this experiment of sending them in Lachish to become uh, peasants, right? They were mistaken for peasants, right? So they came with a boat and they were mistaken because of their Arabness to be of peasants, which they were never in the Arab world. They were not peasants. They were traders. They were uh, jewelry makers. They were you know, members of the elite. They were educated in uh, French schools. So this is the peasantization, you can say, of the Mizrahim. And it's quite striking that, again, this is a project of the state that failed. Lots of it, many of these Moshevim were failing, were not successful. They were escaping from this peasant work because they were just not fit for it. It was just a, a collectivist tsar, Russia, Russia uh, uh, the Tsarist collectivist idea that they should be uh, collectivizing, right? So they, they simply implemented that notion on people who came uh, with absolutely no background in agriculture. But you're right, Moshe, this is a, a known, the class analysis is known, there's plenty of literature about it I can refer you to. I think it is known partly 
through the work of the people uh, around the Spain, yeah. uh, who, who were pioneers in this in this respect as early as, as in other respects. Uh, can I say that um, the next session will relate to that directly, Moshik? Um, in Tzvi's um, presentation, he will talk about that period, which is not covered today, of course, uh, because today is um, mainly about the 50s. Um, but uh, I have three or four questions coming, and we're running out of time. I will try to get all of you in, so please ask the question uh, as briefly as possible. Mayor Amor, please unmute. Hi, Hila. Thank you very much Hi. for the informative uh, uh, presentation. I would ask a very direct and simple question that relates to integrative history and uh, the process by which uh, ethnoclass realities were created in Israel. Would you agree that Mizrahim, Ashkenazim, and Palestinians were created within the Jewish, within the Israeli and Palestinians' history. Because what you describe here is a history of one side, roughly, the Jewish side. However, if you break it down as you did to Ashkenazim and Mizrahim, what is missing is the Palestinian side. So in order to understand the ethno class of Ashkenazi Jews as a hegemonic group, you have to integrate both theories. And that's what created those identities. So Mizrahim is a concept that is accurate because it should be historically specific to Israel, as well as Ashkenazim yeah. Yeah. and yeah, Palestinians. We, yeah, of course, Mayor, and we agree. And uh, I think I tried to show the immediate post-Nakba uh, epoch, obviously from the perspective of Mizrahim. Uh, I tried to show how this is very much present, right? How the history that is untold, that is repressed, is of course connected to uh, the heritage of the decade that Palestinians have, right? Uh, it is of course connected, but this disconnection needs to be made. And 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 you're absolutely right. I'm. Uh, I'm, uh, you know, as I said, that's the story of Azul, that's the story of Cholon, that's the story of everywhere where you put a stone in Israel Palestine, you will uncover the Mizrahi and the Palestinian heritage. By the way, I started with that when I said the majority of the people were disenfranchised. And in that sense, I, I, I do include all of the disenfranchised, one under the military uh, government and the other under the civil authoritarian government. You see what I mean? So in that sense, I started with that. That's how we should start, with understanding this as a joint heritage of the epoch. Uh, yeah, I think this also addresses a point that Moshik made uh, about 650,000. Of course, there were, but uh, about 250,000 of those were uh, Holocaust survivors. Obviously, they were not part of the elite and they were not uh, ruling Israel, and they were disconnected, most of them. Um, Hana Ben, would you ask your question and unmute, please? Ah, there he is. Ah. He is. Hey. Yes. <laughs> My academic name is Omri Ben Yehuda. <laughs> so um, um, thank you so much, Hila, for this amazing presentation and so generous for so much scholarship. I think it's a Mizrahi attitude to, to academia, and we both work a lot about uh, the Mizrahim in academia, and uh, Mizrahi thinkers like Meir and Moshe are so important to us to give them credit and to always remember voices from the South. So uh, that was really nice how you presented it. I have small uh, things, uh, just for instance, uh, Galit uh, Distal, She's not just barbaric or whatever, she's also a poet and a writer. Uh, this is like probably a way of the media to also tackle those figures as Bibistim, like yes. as though they don't have anything else other than Bibi. Um, the clip was very, very interesting uh, because they were also not just wearing uh, the traditional garments, but also the Haki garment. Yes. Uh, of the of the pioneers, 
Um, and then some maybe more important stuff. Uh, we need to remember that the 50s is also the, 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 the epoch of the Fedayun, mm -hmm. the infil infiltrators uh, who came back, the, the Palestinians who came back to their land. And of course, they normally met Mizrahim because Mizrahim were in the development towns, meaning in the, um, uh, in the, the countryside. Border areas, yes. Mm -hmm. The border area in the countryside. Mm -hmm. And this is very important because the Mizrahim were actually, they were the material with which they were able to build the countryside. And every state or, or, or country has a countryside, even Israel, where the countryside is very minor because the country is very small and very much in cities. It's almost a huge, one entire metropole, but still it has this countryside and this countryside is Mizrahi. Yeah. And it's also related to, um, to the industrial zones because before high tech, those who actually did low tech were, were Mizrahim. The, the, the factories were in, the, in those development towns. The industry was in the development towns as well as in the occupied territories. In Gaza, there were fabrics who were, who were working for the state of Israel right until the 80s, including the 80s. Yeah. Um, and another thing is uh, the vocabulary of these 50s that you're, this was the main theme, I think, of your presentation as a, tra as a trauma. It became so much of a vocabulary that we can see how it is being utilizes, utilized by, um, by uh, other minority groups or other groups of the global south in Israel. For instance, immigrants or, or uh, refugees from Sudan and of course uh, Jews from Ethiopia who relate to this same vocabulary of disenfranchisement um, um, so yeah, and I wrote about it um, last year that the, the question is whether we can use the word protest also for the Palestinians, meaning are the Palestinians also part of the Israeli South or the Israeli global South, part of this identity politics? Yeah. Um, that's it, thanks. Yes, thank you, Henri. Yeah, good points. I, and I agree uh, about the border. That's uh, the interesting uh, thing about being uh, border is that in my research on Hulon, I discovered uh, testimonies of people who said, who arrived to Mabrat Hulon uh, because they refused or they did their best not to be sent to Kiryat Shmona and to this Shlomi and to the to the border areas, they were really afraid of it. And we know also that, for instance, in Hud and Hod, there was, there was a story there, right? In Hud, uh, the Palestinian village, um, the, the, the first attempt to populate this place and uh, in the Carmel area was to put Algerian, Algerian Jews there, an entire community in this kind of haunted 1948 houses. And the famous story, to me it's famous, is that they felt the haunted presence of Palestinians and they literally said, we cannot live here. This place is haunted by people who just left. So they, did, they just abandoned uh, in Hod, uh, which became the artist village in Hod for the, we know who, the, uh, the, the people who, uh, who have more privilege in our society. We have one more question, and I think then uh, we probably will have to end. I just wanted to say that when um, myself and my parents, I was a baby, arrived in Jabalia, which is the uh, southern part of Jaffa in 1948, uh, more or less straight off the boat, um, we didn't, of course, know where we we're being sent. I, I definitely didn't, but my parents didn't either. Um, and um, the food was still on the table of the Palestinian family that we have replaced. Yeah. Um, so yes, uh, these were haunted, these houses, these um, villages, these towns were badly haunted by the missing expelled Palestinians. Now I have a question here 
from Gillian Mosley, who has a, a sore throat. So she wanted me to ask you the question. To what extent has the situation improved? And she's referring to later arrivals. Um, I think she mentions the Ethiopians, but of course, um, a larger group and an earlier one was the, the people called the Russians, but they didn't come from Russia mainly. They came from Ukraine. Uh, they came from Georgia. Uh, they came from all parts of the Soviet Union. Uh, can you speak about that, please? How did this new intake change? Did it improve? Did it make it worse? Yeah, you know, it's a known story. So again, I'm relating to your personal history, by the way, my family from Bulgaria also came to exactly that spot, Jebelia and Jaffa. And it's actually that book that I'm quoting from is it tells the story of how Bulgarian Jews took over Jaffa and how Jaffa became Bulgarian. And which is the story of my Bulgarian side, Sephardi Bulgarian side. So it's 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 crazy, uh, but yeah, that's the heritage of of the period. Um, now specifically about this um, immigration from Europe, uh, which was, by the way, in the nineteen, it's a it's an interesting little fact that in the nineteen twenties, uh, the 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 Yeshua at the time, uh, they were having a huge and very cruel selection of who they would let in from Ukraine and survivors of, of persecution and the pogroms there, right? So the, the issue at the time was uh, implementing a, a very kind of racist selection and they refused to absorb refugees from Ukraine back in the 1920s. That's a little known fact, but uh, historian Bura Roy uh, has researched that. Anyways, uh, my point about the issue, I may, I may have uh, under, yeah, didn't get the numbers right, but okay. It was a tiny veteran population that was suddenly in a matter of two years bloated into millions of people, right? So that's, that's the, the demographic insanity that was happening at the time. And what we need to remember is that uh, uh, again, by 1952, it was very clear that the majority of their efforts is to absorb the Jewish refugees from Europe. And that that took priority over and above everything else, include, so obviously also including the developing, developing of the time. For everyone else, they had grand schemes that was that were related to the needs, the demographic needs, the security needs, the economic needs, the economic development needs of the country. But for the people who came from Europe, I'm not saying that people did not suffer hardships. My family from Bulgaria also suffered hardships, and they were Europeans. But you know, the the, the, the not from a privileged background on both sides. I can say you know there is a vast difference between the story of these, these two lineages of the, what happened with the people came from Europe, the way that they were able to galvanize state resources, the way that they were uh, you know, put into the network of the mafia state, uh, the way that the mafia state uh, operated in order to absorb them. Whereas in other cases, we know that it's un bulk, right? The Maghrebi, for instance, migration is one of the worst stories of migration to Israel, the most dramatic stories of migration to Israel, because it was treated really en bulk, right? Masses uh, with one plan for them, right? And this is a plan of uh, that we know has consequences above and beyond the, the epoch. This continues into the third and the fourth uh, generation. Now, um, I have a question here, and that probably will be the last. Uh, from, um, yeah, uh, June Simmons, uh, could you ask your question? It'll be the last question. I'm mute, yeah? Yeah, we can hear you. Great. Um, I'm wondering if the imperialist regimes that had gone before, i.e. 
British. <laughs> um, you know, later... play the minor role. Just <laughs> oh, you think? Yeah. No, I'm kidding. I'm being sarcastic. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, and it's almost as if, in order to counteract previous imperial colonizing powers, the military or the militarization of Israel might have actually partly been a response to that reaction, if you want to call it that, or response, if you want to call it that. Response to what? Can you can you just say in a few more words? Right. The the fact that the area had been well and truly colonized by one imperialistic colonizing expansionist power mm -hmm. um, didn't actually create an element of that as a reaction or response, depending, you know, whether you think it's reactionary oh, or yeah. a response. You know, then I, a very strange story comes to my mind when you were talking. And uh, when we were doing a campaign uh, together with the University of Haduri, Kaduri, Kachuri in Tulkarem uh, in the framework of Academia for Equality, I discovered an amazing heritage uh, that this place in Tulkarem, which is an agricultural school, is a, a copy of the Kaduri school in Emek Israel, so the Zionist agricultural school. And the story goes that uh, the, the uh, yeah, the subject of empire, uh, Mr. Khachuri Kaduri, who was a, a very wealthy businessman in Iraq, an Iraqi Jew. Um, he came in, he, uh, in, of course, with his, with the imperial notion that Jews and Palestinians in the land should work on developing the country in agriculture uh, together. And he wanted to establish this agricultural school called, on his name, Kaduri. And until today, there is a plaque there commemorating this Iraqi Jew in Tulkarem at the, on campus in Kaduri in Tulkarem. And why I'm saying that is that, you know, see, before 1948, it was possible for this Iraqi Jew to imagine him, uh, you know, benefiting that, uh, you know, project of development and modernization of agriculture uh, for uh, the people who are living in or occupying the land, right? And um, and obviously, you know, today we know that, uh, yeah, of course, the Zionists refused and, and they split and they didn't want a, a joint school. And but if you look, if you go to Tulkarim, you just see that it's like Mikve Israel. It's the same structure. It's the same kind of row of palm trees. It's the same kind of, uh, yeah, historically, this 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 has been a land of empire. Um, I think that coming from this exhibition in Paris and uh, just kind of realizing this uh, magna the magna uh, the kind of magnificent history, but also the the, the tremendous loss of uh, because of empire and because of the consequences of nationalist um, mobilizations and everything that had happened. Right, the uprooting was so uh, enormous, an enormous epoch. And um, I think coming to kind of wrap this up, we cannot understand the way that Chico and Sri also say, and Meir and others, you know, we can really cannot understand the magnanimity of the erasures and the losses and the no history that Mizrahim carried um, from that epoch uh, until today. And I think that is our. That is where, where our, the essence of our work as researchers, as intellectuals, as cultural producers, as people who engage with that history, we must uh, remember in the sense of harnessing this memory for retrieving some kind of uh, a vision and that transcends the limitations of Israel, Palestine and, and wants to at the same time revive it, uh, remind, revive uh, some other legacies. Thank you, Jim, for, for the question. I also want to thank Moshik Machove, who reminds us um, on the uh, chat that Kaduri insisted 
on forming two agricultural schools and the Palestinian one is in Tulkaran. So, uh, That's what they and, say. you know, uh, uh, um, of course, um, you know, uh, an Iraqi Jew um, who wanted to support um, agriculture in Palestine and uh, created um, a school for each community. So this is something very important to remember. I want to thank you, Hila, uh, very much for uh, an incredible um, event, incredible presentation, and answering all the questions for almost two hours. Um, it's an excellent event. I'm very pleased personally to learn that uh, I was uh, the neighbor of your parents, or they were my neighbors. And uh, we know this after years of meeting each other, we only find out about this today and we should talk about it. Yeah, um, definitely. I have just uh, completed uh, my first novel, which I hope to publish in English sometime soon. And the Bulgarians, are uh, having Sorry. a very important <laughs> part there because they are the um, most amazing community uh, <laughs> that I have ever met and loved um, all my life. So thank you for telling me yes, this part of you. it. Yeah. Uh, just to remind you that uh, all our webinars, all, all the webinars of the last, um, of the COVID years, I should say, are available through links on the JNP website. I shared um, the address a couple of times. And also more importantly, that uh, uh, we have a, a third part of this first um, series on the 10th of April. And um, you need to register in the same way. We uh, are looking forward to seeing all of you there and share it with your friends that might enjoy and learn from it, like we learned from Dr. Diane. Thank you very much on behalf of JNP. Thank you for this opportunity and good luck, everyone. With your... <laughs> and if you are not members of JNP, why aren't you? Uh, please join uh, on the same website. You can join JNP and help Palestine. Thank you very much. Good evening. Good evening. Bye bye, everyone.